I've got this, Ben. Oh, you do? Yeah. We're listening to Words About Books. I'm Nate. That's Ben. We're not doing a Dune month this year, but we are talking about a similar subject because this is Sandman. I didn't say we weren't doing a Dune month. Yeah, you did. We, you still have to read Dune. You didn't even read Sandman. First of all, of course not. Second of all, we're not doing a whole month of Dune. We're just doing two or, I don't know, maybe three weeks of Children of Dune. We're not, we're not reading another graphic novel and, and watching a video and doing all that shit we did last year. That's true. But yeah, we're talking about The Sandman by Neil Gaiman for DC Comics. I have recently read this. I recently read the entire approximately 75 issue Sandman series. I have watched the entire, I guess, first season that's been released of the Netflix show. And I am now prepared to talk about this comic that has been hyped to me since the dawn of time, it feels like. Oh my god. I think you actually brought this up when I met you in person forever ago. When we went to the comic shop. I've known of it forever. So this, the Sandman comic started in 1989 and it ended in like 1993, I think, the original run. And then I was born in 1988. So as long as I have been reading comics, this has been in the background. This is also going to be the rare Words About Books episode where I don't get much into spoilers. This is a recommendation episode. Oh, no. That's right. That's right. I am calling on you, the audience, and you, the Nate, to read Sandman. This is my mission. Read and or watch. The Netflix show is actually doing a pretty good job. First, I need you to tell me, what do you know of Sandman? So... When little boys and girls need to go to sleep, uh, a guy with a really long white beard and a blue, like, robe, I think, and a really long blue hat, like, he, he creeps into their room with a magic bag of sand and throws it in their eyes, and they go to sleep, and that's why you wake up with little eye crusties the next day. You're very close, except he doesn't have a beard, he is an eight-foot-tall, pale-white goth-looking dude with combat boots and a big trench coat. That's exactly what I just described. Sometimes he wears a helmet that looks like a helmet f the engineers wear in the Alien franchise. It's got like a little elephant trunk. What? Yeah. Did the Aliens engineers have elephant trunks or is that like an addition to the no, helmet? No, it's an addition to the helmet. Okay. It's just on the helmet. Much like with Sandman. It's just on the helmet. And it's it's DC Comics, you say. Yeah, very unfortunately. That is actually the worst part about it. Superman comes in and saves the day. And Superman appears. Great. I know he's your favorite character. Yeah, I loathe DC Comics. I don't like superhero comics much in general, but I find DC's particular brand of superhero comic just especially annoying. Especially Superman. Fortunately, Superman has like one line <laughs> at the tail end of the comic, I think. And it's a joke. Oh, come on. He could save the day. But you know who does appear for more than one line? Batman. Some have called me the Martian Manhunter. Oh. I was eventually going to guess him after like seven or eight other people. Yeah, no, they only use they only use the the B characters. Batman and Robin appear in like a flashback. Uh, John Constantine is there a lot, actually. You mean a B character? Martian Manhunter is A tier. And I'm here to help. I'm sorry. Who are you again? Oh, that's sad. What are his powers? Does he manhunt? <laughs> I don't know why he has that name. He's only A tier because he was featured prominently in, in, in Justice League. Where he did... He was one of the founding members, Ben. Oh, okay. Like, yeah. what, what's he do? I don't know what he does. Do you mean like... What are his powers? Uh, I know he can phase through matter and shapeshift. And uh, mostly that. He's strong and can fly because, you know, everyone is strong and can fly except for Batman. Poor bastard. Oh, he's also a telepath. 
And uh, fire is his weakness. I didn't know that. It's my weakness, too, to be <laughs> yeah, fair. I was going to say, fire is, is most people's weaknesses. Yeah. I think it even beats, like, vampires and stuff. Fire is, uh, you know, that's a respectable weakness. But I assume it's like, like a, a Bic lighter takes him out. or So that's, <laughs> you know, you, you, you distracted me. You distracted me. You were supposed to be telling me what you know about Sandman. I'm guessing the answer is nothing. Well, uh, I know he works with Martian Manhunter and John Constantine. (laughs) Uh, Fortunately, not for very long, though I don't hate Constantine. I'm going to approach this episode from the complete beginner, which is Nate. Perfect. Lay it on me. What is a Sandman and what does he do? And is his weakness fire? He has only one weakness, and that is a complicated system of rules he must follow. Not fire. Fire will not help you there. Oh, so even if I, like, lit him on fire, he'd be fine. Sandman refers to the title character who is the Sandman. He is the anthropomorphization of the very concept of dream. Let me tell you something, Dream. And I'm only going to say this once, so you better pay attention. You are utterly the stupidest, most self-centered, pathetic excuse for an anthropomorphic personification on this or any other plane. Okay. He is of a family of other anthropomorphized concepts, all of which start with D. They are destiny nuts. (laughs) Got it! So we've, so we've got destiny. We got dreams. We dreams got is a part of the family named the endless. The endless are beings that exist above the gods. What? Have you ever read anything Neil Gaiman's ever written? Basically, I want to say maybe. Okay. I know I have some of his books in my house. Does that count? I'm Neil Gaiman adjacent. I I haven't read all of his writing, but I've read Sandman, American Gods, a few other things. And there's a recurring theme in his stuff that basically consciousness creates divinity. So instead of gods creating people, people create gods. If people believe in a god, it will manifest. Isn't this... This is like a quote from a philosopher. If God didn't exist, then we would have to invent him or something like that. Yeah, I I don't think Neil Gaiman's the first person to ever think of this, but he takes it pretty literally. Voltaire, (laughs) maybe? Voltaire? It's not Voltaire. It's Voltaire. Whatever. It has never been Voltaire. Nothing has ever pronounced like that. I said it second, Ben, because I figured you'd (laughs) give me shit about how I said it the first way. You create a really hostile environment. Um, <laughs> I'm going to have to I report do. you to HR. People create the gods, right? The right. endless are not subject to those rules. So a god must be believed in to get its power. Just but like the, Robot Santa Claus. Go on. But the endless exist independent of that. As long as there are people, there will be endless, whether they know there are endless or not. They embody these just inescapable aspects of humanity Like forces of nature? Yeah. Well, more forces of consciousness. So let me list them. Okay, so what you're saying is if there weren't people, they wouldn't exist. Right. They still exist to serve people, but people don't need to be aware of them. I see. All right, go ahead and list them. Destiny, death, dream, a a mystery one. I don't want to give spoilers. Okay, I was like, did you just forget? (laughs) No, I didn't forget. Desire, Uh, despair, and delirium. Delirium was previously delight. Oh, how did that happen? They They never describe how delirium, or how delight became delirium. But yeah, so even if you kill them... Just another one will appear. Now, if they die, will it be a different one of the same manifestation? Well, now you're getting into spoiler territory. Can't uh, help you there. You're going to have to read the book. God damn it. 
I have to read things. I already have to read, like, 600 pages of Frank Herbert again. Isn't that enough? You could watch the Netflix show. Ben, what's your Netflix login? <laughs> <laughs> I will give it to you uh, after we finish the recording. If you choose to read it, however, I do recommend you look for these exact words, The Sandman Book 1. Not Volume 1, not Issue 1, Sandman Book 1. What is the difference? Okay. The Sandman, because it has been around since 1989, has been collected into so many different (laughs) volumes of varying shape and size (laughs) that it becomes nearly impossible to get into the series. If you go to the bookstore... At least the entire time I've been alive until this year. If you go to the bookstore, you will find Sandman Volume 1220 or 11730 or something. Great. It was so long and impossible. (laughs) The barrier to entry was so high. Basically, before online shopping, you would have had to go to the clerk and be like, I want this amount of Sandman. I don't know where it ends, though, so I don't know... Like, what to order? Can you tell me? And I never felt like having that conversation, so I never got into Sandman. That'll be $800 for the entirety (laughs) of Sandman. Yeah. So, in 2022, in anticipation of the Netflix show, they collected the original 75-issue run into four books, which makes it very easy to consume and probably should have been done a long time ago except dc is an ass backwards publishing outfit dude they've got superman they are just like constantly running their own faces into walls trying to find ways to break through into bankruptcy because they're supermen and the wall can't hurt them Checkmate! All we need to do is bring in uh, Snyder to do Sandman, and we'll be fine. I'm also going to do one thing I've never done on this podcast before. It's going to annoy Nate, which is an added benefit. I'm going to tell you the ISBN number of this book, just so it's very easy for you. Got your pencils ready? It's 17795151170. No, I did not have my pencil ready. Thank you, Ben. Well, I'll send you this again when you need to approve the edit. Okay. So you may be asking yourself, what is Sandman? Still haven't really gotten there, have we? Yeah, we really haven't. We've been at this for a while now. I have no idea what's going on. In the spirit of words about books, I am trying to simulate what it's like to read Sandman. The Sandman is a story about... Obviously, Dream of the Endless. It starts in 1918 or or the 1800s, I forget. Roughly 100 years before whatever the present is. If you're watching the show, that's 1910. If you're reading the books, that's somewhere in the 1800s. An Aleister Crowley type is performing a ritual to try to imprison death. But instead... He makes a mistake, or does he, and captures Dream. Whoopsie doodle. He holds Dream in captivity for 80 years. Oh. During which time, the dreaming, the realm of dreams that we all enter into every night when we sleep, has crumbled. And when Dream finally does escape, he needs to go on an adventure to take back his lost tools, which the occultists have stolen from him, and to put his realm back in order. And so you get to see Dream, like, rise up from the very beginning. You get to find out sort of how he operates and what the Dreaming is, and all kinds of crazy characters populate the Dreaming. Including Superman. The DC elements, the the parts where this needs to tie into DC are the weakest, and that's not just because I hate DC. It's because it doesn't belong in that universe, even a little. It actually does not sound at all like this should be tied in with all the other crap, but DC just wants to shove it all in there, just like what they did with Watchmen. (laughs) Oh, God, did they? Yes! 
Watchmen uh, crossed over into the DCU main universe or whatever the hell it's called. No wonder Alan Moore is so pissed at them all the time. And they also made a sequel to Watchmen for some reason. That's what the world needed. Yeah. That's what everybody was waiting for. Who who has the balls to take that job? Who is like, I mean, I'm going to write a sequel to The Watchmen? Some sort of Kevin J. Anderson type, then. Obviously. You're not, okay. Yeah, you're, you're, not, you're not going into this thinking like, I'm going to make this better than Alan Moore did. You're going into this thinking, I could probably make a pretty good paycheck, and uh, let's make some characters that we can sell toys of. So, yeah, Sandman crosses over the DC Universe, and also maybe Watchmen at some point for some fucking reason. Fortunately, there was never a Sandman Watchmen crossover. <laughs> but yeah, so Sandman, the Dreaming is populated with all kinds of wacky characters. There are Cain and Abel. Oh my god. Who are, I guess they're the biblical Cain and Abel, but they're also kind of just the embodiment of the first murderer and the first victim. Oh, are they like a dream of them? Like we dream them into existence the way we dream they're, a god into existence? They're not dreams. They're, they're like archetypes. Oh. And they exist. So this is kind of what I'm getting at. The Sandman is a very dreamlike comic. It wanders the way a dream wanders. There are certain things you just kind of have to accept and move on. And then maybe they'll be explained like ages later. Have you read the whole thing? Yeah, I have. I, I I have to know, Ben. How does the DCU cross over with this? Because you're saying it's weak, and I believe you. I'm just having a hard time wrapping my head. Like, this, this feels like... No, so the DC stuff is most apparent in, I'd say, the first part of the first volume, where the series is kind of still finding its footing, The original pitch for the Sandman was to resurrect an old DC character called the Sandman. DC told Gaiman they liked his ideas, but they wanted a new Sandman. So he created Dream of the Endless. But I think there was still some like finding of the footing, figuring out what the series would be. And maybe the initial thought was it was going to cross over more than it did. I think even Cain and Abel were originally used by Alan Moore in Swamp Thing. Oh my god, he did Swamp Thing? He did a version of Swamp Thing that is apparently legendary. I haven't read it. And and was commercialized and they cut him out, I'm sure. And then they hired someone <laughs> else with less acclaim but who was cheaper and didn't complain as much to follow up that run there will be a separate episode on alan moore don't worry i like alan moore quite a bit i i love i love me an old magician i don't know what else to say i love the simpsons version of him mr moore will you sign my dvd of watchmen babies which of the babies is your favorite you see what those bloody corporations do they take your ideas and they suck them Suck them like leeches until they've gotten every last drop of the marrow from your bones. <laughs> that's exactly what he looks like. <laughs> and it's ex- I'm sure that's what he sounds like, too. He talks about how they'll grab your bone marrow and just suck and suck until you're all dry. <laughs> well, he does worship a snake god. Ah, oh, that sounds like something you would do. I love him. I, lo- I could listen to him talk about magic all day. Does he talk about magic? All day. And uh, I was at this wonderful party. I think the jazz butcher Mm -hmm. was playing. And uh, I said, from henceforth, I am going to be a magician. And then the next morning I had to, when I'd sobered up and I realised I'm going to have to actually do that or I'm going to look stupid. Oh, my God. He, He looks like a wizard, so. He is a wizard. I'm not joking. Oh my god. He practices magic. Is that why he's constantly having all of his shit taken away from him? Well, he hasn't worked with DC in a very long time. But why not, Ben? They have Superman. So Dream has (laughs) three (laughs) tools that are taken from him when he is imprisoned. He has a helm. That looks like the elephant skull helm. 
with cool. the trunk, though. Okay. He has a bag of sand. Fuck he's yeah, sand I called it. And he has a ruby. Uh, okay. I don't know what the helmet does. It looks I'm guessing it's like cool. a Magneto thing. I feel like the helmet kind of just fades away in the series, to be honest. And like when I saw the design of the helmet, I was like, this is there to make him look alien and weird. And it is going to serve no purpose after we learn to love the silhouette of the Sandman. Oh, well, and I was there right. You go. The sand uh, kind of does whatever he wants it to do. Oh, okay. He is the embodiment of dream. The comic is very dreamlike. It doesn't make a lot of hard logical sense. I honestly don't even know if this is for you. I would describe it as Dune-like in oh, why I like it. God. So you know, you know how I just said I love listening to Alan Moore talk about how he practices magic. That's oh. kind of the, the the itch that Sandman scratches for me. So I, I, it might not be for you, and that's kind of where I was going with this initially. I think people who want to try it out but aren't sure. And maybe this is all sounding a little weird and wacky and you're, you're not sure if it's too weird for you. Watch the Netflix show. It's really good. It's really close to the comic. They change a few things, but it all remains very much in the spirit of Sandman. And it's not like I've seen people getting all butthurt about <laughs> the, uh, they're like, they race swapped death. And it's like, she's the embodiment of death. She had literal porcelain white skin and also the endless don't have a, a one shape. They look different depending on who's looking at them. Like dream will always look like what you imagine dream to look like, essentially. Not not this Alice Cooper looking guy, but like I'm looking at this this helmet and uh, I do not get elephant vibes it has a trunk. Yeah, but I'm looking at this picture where it looks more like Cthulhu with the trunk curled inward. If Cthulhu had one trunk... Yeah, well, okay, it's a trunk instead of a mass of tentacles or whatever, but that's what I'm getting. I think that's a big difference. It, it is. But not really. It's It still looks kind of like it. Here, hold on. Can I do my, my duty? There you go. Maybe. Very slowly. I'm sure this is exciting for the listener. I'm I'm sure. So when Superman looks at Sandman He sees he sees himself or something. Is that, is that <laughs> All I know accurate? is when hang on. The flame of wrath. So he looks like a giant flaming head to the Martian Manhunter. Dream collects names. So he is Morpheus. He is the Oneromancer. He's Lord he is a... Lizoril. Yeah, yeah. He's also some Martian deity. Basically, if you have any kind of preconception about Dream... That's what he looks like. So he is an is... old wizard with a long beard who looks kind of derpy. Then I'll look at he him can and I'll be. be like, oh, okay. If that's how you imagine him. Cool. But for most of us, he appears as this gothic knockoff of Neil Gaiman. Alice Cooper. Yeah, he does look more Alice Cooper. He there. looks very but... Alice Cooper here. He does eventually have like shorter hair. And it looks more like Neil Gaiman's mop that he traditionally wears. Is this a is this a Neil Gaiman insert story? Not really. I think the the design for Sandman is based on Neil Gaiman. I'm not sure if that was his idea or the artist's idea. The design of Lucifer is very obviously based on David Bowie. Lucifer makes an appearance, by the way. Oh, okay. But he's a god I guess, or on that level? Question mark. He's a he's a fallen angel. So he's actually so he actually is like the biblical Lucifer. Yeah. So in Sandman, like all religions are kind of valid, but there is 
a constant mention of a creator. But some religions are more valid than others, is what you're saying. No, I don't think so. I think they're just, there is a creator and angels serve him. Is that creator a god in the sense that we dreamt him up and thus he exists? The creator never personally interferes in anything or interacts with the world in any way that I know of. But are the endless above the creator? No, they are not. So there there are gods, then there are endless, then there is a creator of some kind. There is a creator, there are the endless, there are gods. Okay, I'm getting the hierarchy here. It's not a rigid hierarchy. Like I said, it's like dreams. It flows and twists. Yeah, but they're not all dreams. What about destiny? Huh? Destiny's not a dream. No, he's an aspect of, you know, consciousness. So what does he do, Ben? Let's talk about Sandman. What does he do? Other, he, He's getting his artifacts. What, what does he do? <laughs> now I feel like I'm asking you... <laughs> You are a Martian Manhunter. <laughs> are you asking me what his powers are, or are you asking me, like, what his day-to-day routine is, Both. or are you asking yes. me how he gets his artifact? How... Yeah, exactly. Start with his powers. Let's work our way from there. Okay. S- uh, Dream is responsible for maintaining the world of dreams. He is the dreaming. It is an extension of himself. He creates all of your dreams. There's my computer going off in the background. He creates all of your dreams. He creates all of your nightmares. He is the prince of stories. He is responsible for basically creativity, inspiration, anything that sort of is dream adjacent. So is his weakness insomnia? He doesn't fight people. Oh. He's not a superhero. Okay. So what does he do to get his his shit back then if he's not gonna go in and punch an occultist in the face i don't know what he's doing here no i believe the first item he has to get back is his pouch of sand obviously which john constantine happened to have purchased oh and that was john easy. constantine uh accidentally left it or it was stolen from in the comics it was stolen from him in the show it's a little different But also in the show, they do Joanna Constantine instead of John. There are reasons for it, but I I think it would be boring to talk about. Unlike the rest of this, which is pure gold. Is it a a love story? Okay, you know what, fucking computer? I'm done. Shut up. Is it a love story? Yeah. Is what a love story? Is that why they changed John Constantine? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Uh, okay. Something I wanted to say about the comic, but this is a good opportunity to bring it up. Okay. The whole arc of this whole big long story is dream becoming less of an asshole. (laughs) Dream is this, like, he's not a bad guy, but he doesn't really seem to care about people. He's a hundred percent focused on his job He thinks maybe a little less of mortals. Is that before or after he was fucking kidnapped by them for like 80 years or whatever? That actually is what starts to soften him. What? So it humbles him a bit. Oh, okay. He's very like royal in his demeanor. He demands respect from his subjects. He is very anal about following all the rules there is a proper way things should be done and that is how they should be done people do not presume familiarity with dream and then he gets imprisoned and he gets totally humiliated and nobody comes to help him and And he has to bark like a dog it's really awful (laughs) he finds that when he comes back there were a few people and well entities that remained loyal to him and are willing to help him out and he's grateful for that in a way he never has been before and slowly throughout the series he continues to grow in that direction one thing that remains a constant 
And by the end, I think almost an in joke within the series is that Dream is legendarily bad at romance and he's kind of an emo fuckboy. <laughs> okay. They didn't have that term back in the 80s, but that's what he is. He he falls in love deeply and passionately and it is the greatest thing in the world and when it ends it is the greatest tragedy and the dream in itself reigns for days on end threatening to flood everything because dream is so sad it gets to the point where like all the side characters in the dreaming are like uh do you break up with someone again (laughs) it's been raining for 40 days and nights so (laughs) boss probably had another girlfriend but yeah, I, I love that about it. I love that it got to be funny because I was starting to find it funny. And then when the side characters comment on it as well, you're like, oh, he gets it. He gets it. It's not just it's not just this guy who's like honestly, sincerely thinking that this is how how like great romances go. But OK, so he gets his sand back from John Constantine. That's an easy one. John's a good guy. He pretty much they have to go find it. But when they find it, he gets it back. No must, no fuss. Yeah, that next crazy. step. Yeah, next step. He's got to get the helmet. The helmet was traded to a demon. So he's got to go into hell, and he's got to go talk to Lucifer, who is awesome. I love Lucifer in both the comics and the show. In the show, and in, real in the life. comics, it... it in. <laughs> <laughs> In the comics, Lucifer looks exactly like David Bowie, and I believe it's been commented on in interviews, it's supposed to be the like young androgynous David Bowie. In the show, it's played by Gwendolyn Christie, who I think is a great pick for two reasons. She she was a uh, Captain Phasmagoria or whatever oh, in Star her. Wars and and yeah, and she was always she was also the uh, knight Brienne of Tarth right. in Game of Thrones. Right. So I like her because she's pretty androgynous looking herself and she's also like eight feet tall. So she towers over dream. And, and she continuously got like really crappy roles that she was too good for. Yeah. This is, this is a good role that gives her an opportunity to really flex because Lucifer is supposed to be a androgynous and B super intimidating like dream Lucifer in the, I guess in the DC universe because he's in other things. Perfect. Is still the fallen angel. He is the greatest of the angels. And as such is a very, very, very powerful being in his own right. And Dream, especially in his weakened state after his imprisonment and without his tools, can't just go in there and like fist fight Lucifer to take his so helmet back. So he calls back. in Super. No. <laughs> This is just weird to hear that, like, Lucifer and Superman are in, like, the same universe. You're telling me, friendo. I don't know why you watch this shit. I was happy that they got this over and done with pretty early. They got it out of their system. Yeah, they're they're like, yep, okay, he's in the universe. Can I tell you, the dumbest thing about Sandman is the fact that occasionally we have to, to remember they're superheroes. So, like, Sandman was super ahead of its time in including all kinds of LGBT characters. This is probably the first comic I've ever seen that wasn't specifically about the LGBT scene that has a trans character in it. And way ahead of its time on that, it's dealing with, like, the AIDS crisis and stuff. And then you have to remember that while the AIDS crisis is going on, Superman is fighting crime. (laughs) Like, those those two things have to exist side by side in your head for a moment. And I hate that. I just hate that. Like, there are all kinds of people with all kinds of magic and superpowers. And and there's got to be somebody in the DC universe with healing powers, right? And But AIDS. We just didn't. It's a good point, Ben. <laughs> that's on the that's on the Justice League agenda, I imagine. But uh, yeah, so he goes into hell. He's got to do uh, a fun game, the oldest game, a game of symbols, fiddle contest. You'd think, but it's not. It's not a fiddle contest. It's essentially the game they play. He plays it with Lucifer in the show, but I believe he plays it with the demon Karanzon 
in the comics. The game remains the same, though. They each take turns saying, I am a thing in poetic fashion. And then everybody, like, it becomes a vivid realization. And then the other person has to counter it. I am a dire wolf. Prey stalking. Lethal prowler. I am a hunter. Horse mounted. Wolf stabbing. And if the next person can't think of a counter for what the first person said, then the game is over. So someone just says, I'm Superman. Well, Lucifer eventually does wind up saying something like, basically, I'm the heat death of the universe. I'm anti-life. I'm the end of all things. And Dream has to come up with a counter to that. I'm Superman. It's not. (laughs) So I'm not going to tell you what Dream says. That's spoilers. Figure it out for yourselves. All right. Uh, On to the ruby. Sandman must get his ruby back. The ruby makes dreams come true. (gasps) The ruby is in the possession of a homicidal psychopath named John D. I do not know if John D appears in other DC stuff, but he appears to be some kind of Batman villain because he is in Arkham Asylum. <gasps> is he the Joker? No, he's John D. Wow. Oh. The show thankfully removes all the DC references and it's better for it, to be perfectly honest with you. I did not it, again, need to see it, Arkham it Asylum. It really seems like it didn't need them. You don't have to, like, staple everything to the DCU continuity. I'm glad you feel that way, because when when Sandman had to go to the Justice League of America to figure out who bought his fucking sand, that was dumb. Why would they even know? I don't know. I I don't even know why they knew. I don't even remember. Oh, I know who John D is. I mean, I had to look it up for sure. He's he's a Dr. Ah, Fuck, what's his name? Dr. Destiny. Who was a guy in the Justice League show and also other stuff, I'm sure, where he goes into your dreams and fucks you up, Ben. Yeah, he had Dreams Ruby. That's how he was doing that. I mean, not in that show, because they wisely didn't randomly jab Dream in there for some reason. But yeah, so what does Dream do? Is he Does he punch him in the face? Uh, One thing, uh, I, you know what, that gets into spoilers, but I'm going to say that before... Dream gets the ruby back. John D escapes and he is able to use the ruby for a time. And it is a very, very dark scene that I cannot imagine being in a DC comic. Definitely not for kids. He basically drives a a diner full of people insane and they psychologically and physically torture one another and then eventually kill each other. Okay. This was Dream or this was John D? This was John D. This was John D. And Dream uh, shows up just in time to be like, oh. <laughs> oh, shit. I know I'm getting <laughs> blamed for this. He's like, yeah, 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 yeah. You shouldn't have done that. You shouldn't have done that. That was that was a pretty rough one. Pretty rough in the show, too. Rougher in the show, actually. Oh, that, that already happened. Yeah, that happens in the show. So this is all like very early in the comic. Oh, okay. So he gets his shit back, and then it's like, all right, we're doing we're doing more stuff now. That stuff's yep, over. He gets his shit back. He gets his shit back, and then it's all about putting the realm sort of back together and doing the business of being Dream. Is that when he decides to cut his hair? Uh, he never really cuts his hair. So what happens, and I, I actually like this for the comic and for the story, they change artists. It feels frequently to me because... I read it all at once, but I know this came out over four years, so I don't know how long any one penciler worked on this, but there are a lot of weird changes to the the style of the comic, and that makes it feel more dreamlike. Just that the dreaming could be shifting every day, every hour, and it could look similar but completely different. Everything is recognizable, but it looks different, like a dream. They weave in a lot of 
different stories. So there's kind of like two main ways the story is told. One is from Dream's perspective, where Dream is the main character, and that moves the plot along. But as the comic goes on, it is increasingly interspersed with stories where Dream appears for maybe a panel or two. It's stories of people encountering the realm of dreams and Dream himself. And they're basically just one-shot short stories that have something to do with dreams or something to do with humanity. It's basically just human stories that, I was going to say, they're, they're almost too good for the comic, especially given where it started. And that's not a shot against the artists or anything. It It just, like, it starts with this Martian Manhunter and all this stuff, and it ends interspersed constantly with literary fiction and Shakespearean parodies and poetry and and all of this, like, really highbrow stuff that is literature. It, It really is comics is literature. It really... I heard Alan Moore, interestingly enough, once say he didn't love the term graphic novel because... He didn't really know what it meant. Like, is every collection of comics a graphic novel? Or are only the comics that were sort of written the way novels were written graphic novels? Because a novel and a comic strip are trying to do two two different things to your brain. So, like, is She-Hulk a graphic novel in the same way that The Watchmen is a graphic novel? That was an interesting thought. I think it may be a little pretentious, but... He's on to something with it in the sense that when you read Sandman, at least to me, it feels like it's doing the same thing to my brain that a novel is doing to my brain. I feel like I'm reading, not just scanning a comic. Because I read a lot of comics and I've got nothing against comics. I'm not saying they're a lesser form of literature. Yeah, they're just like degenerate by comparison, you know, no big deal. (laughs) They're not lesser, it's just like you're a bad person if you read them. If you could call that reading. <laughs> <laughs> no, not at all. I, I really, I'm really trying to make this point without getting into the what counts as reading. I'm smarter than you, blah, blah, blah debate. I listen to audiobooks. I read comics. Oh. I, <laughs> I value those experiences. I, I think they're all great. But I can tell you, like to Alan Moore's point, when, when I read an issue of My Hero Academia, I don't come away with the same kind of like buzz in my brain that I come away with when I read Sandman. I could read a hundred issues of My Hero Academia and not feel like mentally fatigued, but Sandman asks a little more of you. And I know that sort of still does sound like I'm getting back to saying one is, is greater than the other, but I'm not. Hey, man, not everyone can sit down and pay attention to Sandman. And I'm not even saying you should. I want to give and I want to give a little bit of attention to the criticism. So this this is a five star read for me, but I want to say that I don't think it would be a five star read for you, Ooh. Nate. Ooh, maybe it would, maybe it wouldn't because I it's don't too know. douche philosopher like. Yeah, it sounds like a douche philosopher's dream. I so Neil Gaiman is a good writer. He's way better than Frank Herbert. <gasps> Wait, and no, actually, that's that's not actually shocking. Frank Herbert is not that great. <laughs> so I'm thinking you might, you, you would definitely like this more than Dune. You would definitely like this more than sitting and listening to Alan Moore talk about magic or any of the other like weird douchey things I indulge in. But the comic is at the same time very self-indulgent very melodramatic it definitely has a lot of oh books and stories are magic moments they're literal magic they're actual fucking magic they change you they they are everything that is worth doing and yeah. Yeah. it does get a little head up its own the ass book at times. reading master race ben <laughs> it it doesn't go too far into that i think neil gaiman grounds it pretty well in Dude, real human drama. At any drama. point, does anyone go inside of a labyrinth, inside of a book, inside of a guy who maybe didn't exist? I can't promise that doesn't happen. Oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> there is a library of every book that ever was written and was not written. Is there a scratch and sniff at the end where it's just someone's fart? <laughs> I don't think it, it gets too douchey. 
Okay. But I All definitely, right. I, I think this would be a three or a four star for you. If I know you. What is it on, on the douchometer? I would say, well, how, like, what are the numbers on the douchometer? We haven't used this device. To, before. to be, well, it's so douchey, the numbers are really arbitrary and. uh it's i would say hmm it's it's maybe like an upside down triangle out of a cyrillic a on the scale of yeah i think that's a good way to 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 (laughs) measure it no in all seriousness i think towards the end it goes a little far even for me in in that direction of just like this is so special. This is just the most special thing that's ever specialed. It's so special. It's so great. It's so awesome. Now, I'm going to chalk some of that up to this was a series that a lot of people worked really hard on that was coming to an end and they wanted to give it like a proper send off. They wanted to get all of the feels out. So they had David Tennant walk around and say goodbye to everyone. Oh my God. It's essentially like that. It's essentially like that doctor. Yeah, yeah. Where it's just like, I get it. <laughs> it's a TV show. <laughs> Move it along. <laughs> I get it. David Tennant's crying. He he looks really sad when he cries. Move along now. Move along now. And I, I, I don't know. I... I am sure there are a lot of people who just like cried into the pages reading the end and stuff. And I'm not giving any spoilers. I'm just going to say like, it's sad because it is an end. Like the story does have a beginning, uh, 90% of it is middle and then the end. (laughs) It, it wanders and it's kind of just a way for Neil Gaiman to give a lot of his thoughts on humanity and creativity and the role that dreams and imagination plays and in how our lives. inevitably politics will tend towards aristocracy and like, <laughs> heroes are bad. Um, so yeah, I think, I think I'd be interested for you to read it. I think it would take you a longer time to read than it took me Just because I don't think you'd be as into it. And it is very long. The reason I mention all this is because I have seen people saying what I thought I was going to be saying, which was this thing has been hyped up my whole life, my whole comic reading life. Everybody has told me the Sandman is the greatest, most award winningest, most high fantasy, high literature concept ever conceived by man. You have to read the Sandman. It's so fucking good. Sort of what they do with Saga these days, if you've ever heard of that comic. Nope. I thought there was no way it could live up to the hype. For me, 100% lived up to the hype. Oh, my God. That being said... Fucking Mark. (laughs) That being said, there are definitely points where I see it as self-indulgent. And I like it. I like where it's going. If I were writing it, I would want to indulge myself, too. Neil Gaiman's writing clicks with me. If you have read Neil Gaiman and you don't like it, this isn't going to change your mind. If you're not into these high concept, I think we talked about it a little bit with like Uzumaki maybe, which is kind of weird to bring up here. But if you need concrete rules and things that make sense and you're not really willing to just sort of like swim through this series, like it's very wishy-washy and contradictory and just dreamlike and if you don't like that if that's not how your brain is organized i could see this becoming tiresome very quickly and i don't think that's necessarily a you problem i think that's just this goes on a bit too long in my opinion the the comic starts treading water probably in its last year I'm there for it because I like everything that's going on. I could, I could watch Cain and Abel all day. I could read a book that's just about Cain and Abel. I love those two. They're a comedy duo. If I didn't make that clear. Oh, you didn't make that clear <laughs> at all. Actually, Cain, Cain constantly is killing Abel, and Abel always comes back. Like he, Cain kills him. He buries Abel, and then a few hours later, Abel will resurrect unharmed, and Abel is just like. The sweetest, most innocent man. 
that ever walked the earth and you just all he wants is for his brother to like him (laughs) (laughs) and you know like you and you get the vibe that like Kane does like him but he won't admit it and you think Abel knows that too and there's just all these little moments of connection where you love seeing characters get along very heartwarming I think if you're a long time comic reader and you've listened to this and you've listened to all the hype about it. I'm sure words about books is not going to be, uh, the, the thing about Sandman that breaks through. I'm sure everybody is pretty saturated with Sandman stuff right now, but if you're an experienced comic reader and this sounds good to you, jump into the comics. If you're on the fence, jump into the show. All right. It's my recommendation. That's Ben's recommendation. Definitely wasn't an attempt to cash in on a popular craze and also give me another week so I can finish reading Dune. It actually wasn't. I mean, it, we did schedule it this way so that you could get another week to read Dune. But I was actually reading this before the show came out. I started reading it when I saw... I didn't even know okay, that Okay, so you liked it out. before it was cool. It when it, okay, all right. No, I liked it long after it was cool. But I started reading it when I saw this four-part collection come out. And I was like... I can manage four books. Okay. That's when I decided to start reading it. It had nothing to do with the show. I don't, I liked the show. The show was a pleasant surprise. It's one of the few things Netflix hasn't absolutely fucked up. I look forward to their upcoming live action One Piece project. Uh, what? Anyway, you can check us out on Twitter at WAB Pod. We got a blog at blog.words about No, at that one piece. Instagram at needs, Words about It needs Superman. Don't give it up, Luke. Uh, they got an email address, Words about <laughs> pod at gmail.com. And we have, we have, we have a Patreon link in the description. We got tiers. We got benefits. We got polls. If you subscribe at the $5,000 tier, Nate, We'll take you on a trip to Disneyland. I would too. You want you want to put that tier up there? If someone gives me five thousand dollars, I'll I'll go to Disneyland with you. Yeah, you can probably you can probably cut that. No, no, I'm definitely gonna cut that. Ronald Reagan's a piece of shit. Anyway, go on. I'll leave that. <laughs> <laughs> I'll leave that in. <laughs> I think people will infer what we were talking about. We'll 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 infer.